Hello and welcome to the Sustainability Leaders Series. I'm Oriel Morrison. The role of transport in sustainable development was first recognised at the 1992 United Nations Earth Summit. The UN noted that over the next 20 years, transportation would be expected to be the major driving force behind a growing world demand for energy. Transport of people and goods accounts for close to a quarter of the world's energy-related greenhouse gas emissions making change in the sector crucial to meeting global net zero targets. The world's rising population, along with rapidly increasing urbanization, only serving to add to demand for transport. By 2050, 70% of people are expected to live in urban centers. According to the Global Infrastructure Outlook, more than $2 trillion of transport infrastructure investments will be needed each year until 2040. And governments around the world have stepped up. The US has committed $2 trillion towards infrastructure, Europe $850 billion, and China $500 billion. The good news, some of the tools needed to curb emissions are already being implemented in many countries. Global sales of electric vehicles doubled between 2020 and 2021, and other options including sustainable fuels are already in play. New forms of transport, like electric scooters and bikes, are becoming more and more prominent in our major cities. The rise of drones, the concept of green corridors, and the adoption of government policies and incentives are all making significant headway. Road travel accounts for around three quarters of today's transport emissions, with the majority from passenger vehicles followed by trucks carrying freight. Now, in order to achieve the UN-backed goal of net zero emissions, the road transport sector will need to undergo what's known as deep decarbonisation, which involves transformation of every aspect of how we travel. Now, this includes how the world's urban areas are designed, built and powered. I'm joined now by the man who quite literally wrote the book on this. Peter Newman is Professor of Sustainability at Curtin University and coordinating lead author for transport for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. With 20 books and more than 350 academic papers to his credit, Professor Newman is an esteemed global authority and he joins me now. Professor, welcome. Thank you. How does the Asia-Pacific the transformation there, the progress on our transformation compare to other parts of the world? Well, in the time when we began to collect data on cities, the three that stood out as models for how to go into the future were Tokyo, Singapore and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. They clearly were wealthy cities, but they had significantly less car use and more public transport, more walk, walking and cycling, and significantly less oil. So um, the numbers were extraordinary. The interesting bit about that was that Singapore uh, had a period where they were told that they could not get any World Bank uh, grants uh, if they wanted to build a mass transit system. Uh, by a Harvard economist who said there's nothing wrong with buses and it, the, the whole process of developing your city will be based around cars. They disagreed with that and built a rail system which is second to none in the Asian area. That then spread across Asia as a model right through into China. Hong Kong basically was doing the same thing as, as Singapore. and. That has dramatically shown the world that you can make busy, difficult car-based cities into be transformed into significantly better places uh, by getting good urban rail. So, Professor, from a global perspective then, are we transitioning our energy use when it comes to transport fast enough to save the planet? We are the laggard in, in, the, uh, in the systems that uh, are needing to be changed. Um, power has been the leader in the last 10 years 
Transport continues to increase in its amount of oil it's consumed and greenhouse gas produced, uh, whereas power is going down rapidly as gas and coal are found to be no longer needed in the systems, coal especially. Um, so the next phase is going to be electric for all of trans land transport. And that land transport uh, starts with balancing you your public transport along with your um, private transport. All of this can be electric um, and can feed into the solar systems that are being built in the power system. Now, Professor, you've been looking into net zero corridors. Um, tell us how these will work. Yeah, net zero corridors are, I think, a way for the land transport system and cities to begin the process of going net zero overall. So you start with a main road where you've got a lot of traffic and you say one lane of that could become a mid-tier transit system like a trackless tram, batteries on the roof and it plugs in at, at stations if need be and you build around those stations net zero buildings and all of that can fit together to create a whole corridor that is net zero. Uh, Professor, how does this relate to freight then when it comes to the net zero green freight corridors? Yes, the other corridor was really residential and urban traffic, uh, whereas freight is an issue of getting how the regions feed into cities and ports. And there's an emerging idea of net zero green freight corridors. So if you start with a mine, for example, where they're producing lithium or manganese or magnesium or whatever it is that's needed for this new 21st century technology and the world needs it. Um, so you process that, you dig it up and you put it on a train and take it down a corridor that can be carried by electric trains, of course, that are... Mm powered by the sun, uh, but then it takes it to a spot where they can process it. And the processing to get it into battery ready minerals can happen uh, along that train line. Um, and increasingly that's going to be using hydrogen as the reducing agent as well as the heat source. So you, can, you need to make that hydrogen locally. That means getting solar to break down the water and create the hydrogen. But the best thing is you use it right there, process, you've got your green lithium and a, you take it then to the port and at the end there, the process of getting it onto the ships and that whole port operation, that can also be net zero. So you can then have a green freight corridor that is bringing that mineral through its processing into the export markets that would take it around the world. Mm. Uh, Professor, such a pleasure to have you with us here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Under increasing pressure from stakeholders, companies in the transport and logistics sector are exploring new ways of meeting net zero targets. This includes circular business models, particularly in the supply chain. Globally, Brambles is taking a leading position, with the world's largest pool of reusable pallets and containers. I'm joined now by JJ Frejo, Chief Sustainability Officer for Brambles. JJ, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, you have just brought your net zero deadline forward by a decade to 2040. That's substantial. Now, you've also announced some new climate targets. They are ambitious commitments. Talk us through these changes. Okay. So, yeah, and uh, we are living in a time where our targets need to be ambitious. We really need to accelerate action. We are uh, probably one of the few companies, unfortunately, I have to say, that operates a pure circular business model on a global scale. So rather than uh, customers, our customers, rather than buying packaging, they can rent packaging from us and then they can reuse it over and over again. A community of customers, a community of users of packaging share that packaging in a circular model. So we make sure that it never goes to landfill and it's reused over and over again. That is what we do. 
With this in mind, uh, some, t- some years ago, we put in place these ambitious targets to reduce, reduce the environmental impact of our customers when they operate and, and their supply chains when, when we operate them as well. We buy from sustainable sources, certified, ensuring no deforestation. But that is not enough. In the, in, in, in the world of today, reaching zero is not enough. As I sometimes say, you know, doing less bad is not enough. We need to do some actual good. You know? And this is where we came with this idea of net positive, of regeneration. Our vision is to create, uh, to pioneer a regenerative supply chain. We already, as I said, we already reached zero deforestation in our operations. Now we want to go into this uh, net positive and create new forests, new, new forest mass in the world. So this is something that we can do now. You, you talked about the company's circular business model, which of course supports the sharing and reuse of pallets and containers. Can you take us through how the pooling model works globally? Absolutely. So I will put an example. You know, well, first of all, the next time you go to a supermarket, if you look at the floor, you will probably see some, some blue pallets. That's us. And what is the difference? And those are circular pallets. That is circular packaging. And what is the difference between that, between that and the linear model, the alternative model? Our customers need pallets, crates, and containers to move their goods across the whole supply chain. And they have two options, basically. They can buy a pallet that, that, that they own and then they use. And at the end of the supply chain, when the manufacturer sends their goods all the way down to the supermarket, then that pallet is probably disposed of. You know, it's sent to recycling or it's sent to, to a landfill, which is the worst possible option. We provide an alternative to that, okay? Our, we, we keep the ownership of our packaging and we rent out those pallets, crates, and containers to a manufacturer. The manufacturer will hire, will rent the pallet, will put their goods on the pallet, and it will go throughout the supply chain. And then we will make sure that we collect that pallet, that we collect that pallet, we repair it if needed, and we give it to another manufacturer, maybe a competitor of the first one. So the characteristics of this model, I think it's clear. First of all, it is a, sh- a reuse model. And I think it's important to not, not to be confused because for many people, circular economy is about recycling. Mm. So JJ, what are, what are the key circular innovations? I mean, you've just talked about uh, one, but what are the key circular innovations? And of course, technologies uh, as well that Brambles has adopted to make this all possible. Well, if you operate a circular business model, the main thing that you want to do with our with your with your assets is to recover them. Okay, that is, that is probably that is that, that is again not the the secret. So we have been investing for years, and now we are in this program of uh, of um, digitalization. We really want to know where our pallets are to make sure that we will collect them back and we will be able to to operate this model in, a, in an even more circular way. Mm. But also, you know, when you start operating the circular models and you start to have visibility of what happens in the supply chain, there are other things, other fantastic things that you can do. We know decarbonization and CO2 emissions is a challenge of our time and transportation in supply chain is a significant source mm. of the supply chain emission, the, the transportation emissions. And uh, by having more visibility of how, where our pallets are, and where they go, we can have, we can see millions of flows, millions of flows of pallets moving in one direction and in another direction. So then we are in a very, very good position, in a privileged position to unlock efficiencies in transportation. Mm. But this sort of fits into the question that I wanted to ask you. Uh, on, a, on a personal and also on a business level, what is the most difficult part of your job? Y- you know, you are the sustainability leader of a global transport m- business, high emissions, difficult job. What's the most difficult part of it? I think the most difficult part of my job is to reach the whole supply chain. We are in a company where we have been operating a circular business model for a long time and where the culture of sustainability is there. In our company, people feel it's our DNA, you know, and we want to do more. But now, when if you want to have a real impact, and that is what we want with this, uh, with this regenerative supply chain vision, you really need to act and put an impact in the whole supply chain, in your supplier, in the supplier of your supplier, and all the way up, you know, through the, through the, through the value chain. And sometimes even, uh, and the good thing is that now, especially after the pandemic, when there has been this sustainable revolution, you know, everyone wants to do their part. Mm, absolutely. Uh, JJ, such a pleasure to chat with you today. Thank you so much for your time. 
Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, let's join the regenerative revolution. Mm, absolutely. All behind that. Now that wraps up this episode of the Sustainability Leaders Series. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Oriel Morrison. For more in this special 12-part series, head to apacnetwork.com. Mm-hmm.